very tasty. We're gonna use So I'm gonna use props. Um, so I decided to do an impromptu, uh, just a video. Uh, there's a lot of things that have been going on. It's been uh, exciting now, six months. I guess starting with the Terra Luna crash in crypto, which wasn't that exciting to me because I didn't have any Terra Luna um, or their stable coins because in my opinion, I thought it was all nonsense. Not trying to, uh, um, diminish what Doquan and L have done, but uh, most of those stable coins that they put together are unrealistic and not done by true financial engineers who understand the markets, in my opinion. And I'm just a dad, so it's not like I'm super smart like many of these other guys. But after Terra Luna, that prompted, uh, left a lot of gaps in full value where people thought they had assets, uh, assets of value and they didn't. So Terra Luna, caused uh, the Three Arrows Capital and the Voyager and Celsius, which then um, metastasized with FTX when the truth came out um, with a competitor who uh, published a balance sheet and et cetera, et cetera. But that was just crypto, or so it says. But it wasn't really crypto because um, a lot of the detractors from crypto want to say crypto is bad, crypto is this, crypto is that. It came from people who didn't know what they were doing, trying to put together a car. You have someone who doesn't know how to build a car. They put a car together, that car crashes. So you're gonna say cars are bad? You're gonna say the guy didn't know what he was doing when he put the car together. That's that whole Terra Luna issue, the Celsius of Rogers and all that. Um, the centralized version of a decentralized lender is a centralized lender. Just that simple, okay? And they were put together in a haphazard and irresponsible fashion. And again, I don't intend to point fingers or call anybody names, but let's call a spade a spade. What's the difference between Silicon Valley Bank and uh, Celsius? One was FDIC in short. Just that simple, okay? Um, speaking of that, after the big crypto malaise, you had the Silicon Valley Bank, you had signature bank issues, you had, what was this, the other S? Bank, another S bank collapse. I can't think of the name of it. Think of it off the top of your head. So many of them, right? Signature, etc. Um, and uh, Credit Suisse just went down. Um, today I was looking, and they uh, were purchased or assets were purchased by UBS. The um, bank is 167 years old this year and it's gone. $17 billion of their um, bondholder equity, uh, bondholder value, wipe clean, zero. Shareholder value, wipe clean, zero. Gone after 167 years. Now you have four U.S. banks. Um, you have Credit Suisse, which is a 167-year-old global European bank. Do you think there's a banking problem? I wonder about a banking issue coming up two years ago, very, very clear about that. Um, most of the issues you see going on now are just the tip of the iceberg. I am in, I was about to say Williamsburg, but I'm in Dumbo now. So I can look out the window and I see construction. And that construction is overshadowing vacant real estate. Now, what does that mean? That means you have an empty container that you can't fill up because you can't talk to anybody and pay and fill it up. So how do you solve that problem? Get five more containers. Now you have five empty containers. That's a problem. The bubble is still here. As a matter of fact, with the boom bust uh, way of managing the economic cycles and the money system, the booms are getting bigger, the busts are getting bigger, and there's no incentive to reduce them. The, uh, from what I understand, there's a group of regional banks who are petitioning the, their regulators to ensure, have FDIC insurance for all depositors, not just up to $250,000. Why in the world would you do that? Because you want to, of course, protect all depositors. That causes profligate behavior. That means that no matter what I do with my money, I'm going to have somebody bail me out. 
Listen, if you take your money and you put it in the bank, you make sure that bank is safe. If you don't have the wherewithal to make sure that bank is safe, then you shouldn't be putting it in the bank. It's just that simple. Okay, so now, you know, due diligence, personal responsibility is going to the wayside. Everybody gets protected according to the tax, by the taxpayer dollar. You're going to have the fall of the empire that way. That's guaranteed. My personal opinion, let's talk of another topic now. Hopefully, either my videographer or my absolute genius son to my right will join the conversation and ask me some questions. Any questions? Come, genius son. You have to get you have to get a lot closer into the camera, unless you don't want to be in the camera. Actually, you know something? We won't have them in the camera. Okay. So, give me a topic, or you give me a topic to talk about. You could talk about anything: patents, potential litigation, IP, CBDCs. I want to talk about CBDCs. You want to talk about where CBDCs? Do you, where do you think that's headed? Like, to ask me very specific questions. questions. And can you be heard in the camera? I'm pretty sure I can be heard. Okay. Do you think we're closer to a, a centralized? digital banking currency? You know, it's interesting because that's not what CBDC stands for. Not okay. No, you got it right. <laughs> but you got it right by mistake. He said centralized digital banking it's currency. Central banking digital currency. No, central okay. bank digital currency okay. is what CBD stands for. Uh -huh. What it is, is exactly what you said. Centralized digital banking currency. It's basically taking the currencies and centralizing it because electronically, they technically can have full control over almost anything that has to do with the currency. I like that. That Freudian slip is genius. You see that? <laughs> so now, as to whether we're getting closer to it or not, we already have it. Many countries have, or several countries, have already isu um, started issuing the currencies. Hasn't been working that well for them, but then again, this is a big paradigm shift in the way things are done. It does take time. You had the e-Naira, which was issued in Nigeria. Here's a fun fact. I went to Nigeria in 2018 and introduced a digital currency, VE Gold, which is denominated back and based in gold, which is available in Nigeria and its neighbor country, Ghana. Ghana is currently the largest producer of gold in the African continent, in the African continent. If I'm not mistaken, is the largest producer of gold in the world. Put that in perspective. That means that something that they have in abundance, they get right from under the ground, can back their currency. And that currency went back from what they have in abundance under the ground, makes it stronger and harder than the US dollar, the euro, and the yen, even a Swiss franc. So doing it my way, Nigeria could have had the strongest currency in the world and wouldn't have cost them any additional money. But they went with some other vendor not to disparage that vendor. And if you Google fights in Nigerian bank, you can see what the people think about the new Inaira. Okay, they are now going through and I think they have uh, retained R3 um, to advise on reconstituting the Inaira. I'll not comment on that further. But I do believe a lot of the technology that is being exported out of the US has been patented by a tall, loquacious, extremely handsome, and intellectual man. Not that young anymore, but age is like fine wine. I don't know who he is, but if I come up with the name, I'll let you know. Okay, so that's the e-Naira. There's the e-yuan out of China. There's the sand dollar out of the Bahamas. Uh, I think the, the Jamaican currency is called the, I can't remember, oh, the jam the jam dollar, I think, or something like that. Fun fact, in 2017, I went to Jamaica, and I believe I was the first one to introduce distributed technology and the digital currencies, national sovereign digital currency, to Jamaica as well. Um, I believe that they did not like the way a certain government agency in the U.S. talked about me, and I, they all decided to uh, not do business with me, unfortunately. But as it turns out, I was an early pioneer, and I believe I was correct. So that's in a nutshell. There are many other digital currencies coming out. Fed Now is launched Monday, I think, which is a real-time payment system, or set, 
quasi real time payment system to over uh, basically bring SWIFT up to quasi modern technology. And that's a precursor to the US uh, CBDC. The S European Central Bank is working on the same. So is the Bank of England, the Bank of Japan, the most powerful central banks in the world. So it's definitely coming. It's here and it's not going anywhere. Interesting. So imagine if someone could patent that. Wouldn't that be cool? It's like having a patent on e-commerce in 1997. Pre-Facebook, Google, Netflix, pre-Amazon. Cool stuff. Ask me questions. Let's build. I'm going to make noise, background noise. Ask me questions. Anything, by the way. It's probably going to become unpopular, and anybody who doesn't want physical cash, give it to me, I'll take it. Okay? I'm all for it. Physical cash is OG privacy coin. It is the original privacy coin. It works. Okay? Physical cash is being phased out and has been phased out. There are many places in New York City, particularly Manhattan, that won't take physical cash right now. And there are many places who believe in physical cash almost only. Not many, but there are a few. Um, you go phase out physical cash, and that gives you more control over the currency circulation and the, um, the retail level um, money system, transaction of currency. Uh, that comes with a lot of strings attached, you can imagine. You imagine if you take physical cash and you put a couple of algorithms to track it and control it, and you uh, reference it with cell phones. I can literally control what you do. I know where your location is at any given time with your Apple Watch or your iPhone. Um, I can tell you um, what your frame of mind is, your state of being, when you made a certain purchase. Because you could get a heart rate from a smart watch. You get a location from a smart watch and a phone using Wi-Fi triangulation, potentially Bluetooth, um, the cell phone tower, triangulation, GPS, cost, and specific. So if you went and did a drug deal, okay, with a CBDC, a centralized bank digital currency, a centralized digital currency, I like that, by the way, you can actually, you know, reveal so much information. Imagine if someone said, uh, I didn't want you buying marijuana, even though it's legal. Or you live in New York where it's, a liberal or moderate town, and you decide to go to a Trump rally. And they say, you know, I don't want people with a FICO score under 650 going to a MAGA or hard right Republican or conservative rally. I don't think I'm going to cut off your access to that CBDC, but only until you come back towards the center or go left, since you're a New Yorker. And that's just the very beginning. You go steal something, you went away, you go to court, I didn't do it. Well. I see there was a transfer here. I see your heart rate spiked up. And then it calmed down as you got X you know, meters away from the action. There's so much that can be done. The last thing that you need, you know, people give away. Now, a lot of people voluntarily give this stuff away. Instagram, you know, I'm a technology head, you know, and I've always been tech savvy or tech curious. But what people put in Instagram voluntarily and TikTok amazes me. You know, so the CIA and the FBI, you know, this is a godsend to them. People are like, well, they're going to shut down Bitcoin. Why would the FBI ever shut down Bitcoin? You know how much it would cost for them to build something like that from scratch? Come up with an idea and they get everybody to use it, right? How could the FBI get a thief to go and do a crime and then take the proceeds of that crime and put it into a system that would track the FBI right to you? Very difficult for them to do that. You know, old school privacy coins like the U.S. dollars, the actual physical paper is one thing, but they're using Bitcoin. And like I said, it's not that Bitcoin is bad, but it's not made for theft. And if you're a smart thief, you don't leave a paper trail to the crime. Or at least if you're a smart thief that wants to stay free. So, interesting, dystopian, apocalyptic, or pro-governmental future, depending on which side of the fence you're looking at.
ask me questions, talk to me, get me going. That's why I wish I had like people here to just talk and vibe with. And I want to get in an argument and a fight with somebody about a racist. Because I like that, it's more fun. I have a colorful shirt on. What's the shirt say? HBCU Man. Yes. And at the top, I brought this at Howard University, my alma mater. It says, unapologetically, unadulterated HBCU made. So for those who don't know what an HBCU is, it's a, what is it? Historically Black College University. There you go. Historically Black College University. Um, I've had a real rough few weeks. Um, you know, a friend and, you know, a trusted business partner died um, and it left a big gap, you know, in a lot of the strategies that we were doing. And uh, it brought to mind a couple of realities. Um, I went to an event and uh, someone asked me what I did. I said, I'm in a crypto. And a couple of them smirked. One of them said, really? He said, what do you do? I said, well, now mostly IP. I said, I invented DeFi, decentralized finance. And they laughed. I'm like, what's so funny? They're like, you invented DeFi? I'm like, yes. Depending on where I go and what the, you know, what the crowd is, I get that response a lot. And I realize that the world is changing. Access to information, if you know how to look for it, is getting easier and easier. That barrier is dropping. The quality of the information, I thought, was becoming more and more um, convoluted and, uh, how do I put it, uh, diseased. But it's the same as it was when I was young. When I was young, you used physical encyclopedias, actual books for paper. Now you use Wikipedia. But those physical encyclopedias we were filled with a lot of nonsense. And the same people now control Wikipedia which fills with a lot of nonsense. I'll give you an example. I purport to have discovered DeFi or invented DeFi, at least applied DeFi with higher level finance. Um, if you look up DeFi, it didn't include me. I had a lengthy uh, Wikipedia page. It was deleted. Um, I had a lot of followers, social media followers who put it back up. They deleted it again, three or four times, permanent deletion. They attributed the discovery of DeFi to other entities who came in years after me. And the reason was because they had third party recognition. They had a CNBC interview, a Bloomberg article. I've had dozens, okay? They're not used to somebody different coming in and doing something grand and getting recognition for it. So uh, I could put this video on YouTube I could say I invented DeFi. I have three patents issued, one in the US, two in Japan, all foundational technology. I'm working on many more. The products that I used are very high level that I invented and very simple. They're the precursors for Uniswaps and Aves and NFTs and cold storage and NFTs. But when people think of that, they don't think of a guy who sits here with an HBCU shirt on, totally natural hair. My natural hair looks very different from almost any board meeting you see for any crypto company in the US. As a matter of fact, I look, sound, and act differently from everybody with a different background. That diversity is strong. That diversity means the person who invent DeFi gets to invent it and hopefully flourish and cause these ideas to propagate. Instead, that particular person who's different is ostracized and attempt to be shut out. That is anti-American, anti-capitalistic. Also hard on a brother's ego. But when you are able to take a step back and look at things strategically, it has benefited me significantly. Significantly. Because why do you think that benefited me? Take a guess. Long pause. Shorten the pause. Get that answer going. Go ahead. The technology that, um, and he said build a comeback because I was taken down by uh, a regulator, the enforcement arm of a regulator. And uh, I do believe that I was treated very differently from many others in my position. Let's put it there. Okay. Now, um, the technology that the patents represent, 
are now foundational. It's the foundation layer for the entire industry to be built on top of it. Because I was muzzled, muted, silenced, and not covered, a lot of people took this technology and just incorporated it into their businesses, into their business model, into their industry, to the point where everybody uses it. Everybody. Probably wouldn't have happened if everybody realized we should stay clear of that and make a turn because XYZ owns that IP. And if we don't want to license that IP, we should engineer around it. But nobody respects XYZ, not nobody. A lot of people do. But certain industries of, or certain titans of this particular industry don't. So they imprudently ignored it and they incorporated it. Now, the foundation of most of the banking infrastructure coming up is in control of a very, very small set of hands. Not too small, my hands are pretty big. <laughs> Funny joke, right? But uh, in the, under the control of a very, very small group, very small group. Um, the technology that underpins NFTs, where a lot of the luxury brands are coming in, uh, a lot of the uh, household names, industrial manufacturing, who do NFTs for branding. I don't want to name any particular companies because you know, I don't want to cause any legal issues, but all that is underpinned by this technology. Silicon Valley and everything that they're doing, coming in for it, the metaverse, Web3, is underpinned by this technology. Wall Street on the other coast and their products and services, transaction uh, vehicles and mechanisms underpinned by this technology. Here, diversity made a difference in moving the country forward, and the uh, aversion to diversity has actually made the diverse owner of this technology that much more powerful. Interesting lesson. Talk to me now. Let's talk about the USB-C DTAG Okay. Um, foregone conclusion, I warned everybody about that, I think in October, um, about USDC and Circle. Um, fair, and here, disclosure now, uh, a company that I control has sued Circle for a patent infringement and its use of USDC and its transfer of USDC and as well as use of uh, staking pools um, and staking ser infrastructure services with Ethereum. So I want to get that out the way. So. It can't be said I'm talking trash about Circle. Um, I talked trash about them before they were sued, too. <laughs> it wasn't trash. Uh, I actually respect, you know, the company as far as the company goes, but I think there are a lot of things that I would do differently. So you can ask me what's wrong and I'll tell you, or just individual questions. Let's build together. Well, what do you think could be done differently? Um, well, the stablecoin industry or the stablecoin product, there are two different types of stablecoins. You have algorithmic, like uh, Terra, Luna, Stablecoin, or like MakerDAO's DAI. Those are algorithms that make changes to the stablecoin to attempt to keep it stable relative to a dollar. Um, I heard Terra Luna's was a, didn't really work, but that's what I heard. Don't go by rumors what I heard. Um, DAI I know rather intimately uh, in MakerDAO, and uh, it has its pluses and minuses, and it's becoming hypocritical now. For instance, what DAI is, is an algorithmic stablecoin that's really a loan. You have a smart contract, you can make DAI yourself. You go to a smart contract, you put in assets that it accepts as collateral, and it spits out a loan, and that loan is in the form of a DAI, a stablecoin. So you put in 100 F, 35 USDC, and whatever, 15, whatever other stable um, collateral that the smart contract accepts. And it spits out the equivalent of, say, 50% of all that as a stable coin. So you put in uh, $100,000 worth of assets, it'll give you $50,000 of DAI, okay? And you pay interest on that uh, loan, and that interest goes to uh, the MakerDAO organization, okay, or make a DAO users through a smart contract. Now that DAI is algorithmically tied to the value of a dollar. So if for whatever reason the collateral goes down, right, the DAI past a certain point, the smart contract sells the collateral off, 
to try and liquidate it to make sure that the die can keep pegged to a dollar. You can put more collateral in, but if it breaks the uh, loan to value ratio threshold, it just liquidates everything and it takes the die back. Now that die can be bought and sold and used as the equivalent of a blockchain dollar. That's an example of a working algorithmic stablecoin. The other stablecoins were asset back, where you take something like a USD or a Tether or a Paxos dollar, which also white labels for Binance and Gemini. So the Gemini USD and the BUSD, those are Paxos coins, just white labeled. And Paxos uh, uses uh, the same thing as Circle and Tether. You give them $100,000 and they spit out 100,000 Tether, USD, or Paxos dollars, okay? Or their white label name brands. Now you have not a loan, but you have an IOU where you could get your $100,000 back. This is $100,000 in USDC, you gave them $100,000 in cash. Now you could take this USDC and you could go and use it as a dollar, allegedly. But this is not a proxy for a dollar. I've had a couple of fights and arguments in Twitter from people who are so much smarter than, you know, this guy from the HBCU. And uh, they say, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know money. You don't know banking. You know, I point them to many reports that I wrote up in the banks and that collapse after the bear reports one after another. I have like 86 um, accurate calls. So to say I don't know what I'm doing is a stretch. Now, I admit I'm not as smart as all the other guys, but... I know what I'm doing a little bit. So the reason why they're wrong and about the USDC being a proxy for a dollar is I could take a dollar, which I don't have it in my pocket, but I could take this dollar and I can, here, son, I can give that dollar, I can invest that dollar to my son there. And he can say, um, you give me one dollar as a loan and I'm gonna go and do things with it, and then I'll give you a dollar seven back. That will be a 7% straight interest rate. I can do that with no problem, okay? But if I got that dollar by giving USDC, I mean, circle a dollar, right? They take the dollar that I gave them, and what do they do with it? How does circle make money? They take the dollar that you give them, and they invest it. And they keep the investment income. What do you get for your USDC? Say it so the camera can hear you. Nothing. How, how much, I again? I get my dollar, and that's it. So numerically, how much do you get for the risk that you're taking? Oh, zero. There's zero. zero. That's the number, zero. You, you know, don't be shy. Zero, zero, yeah. right? So are you taking risk when you give money to Circle? Yes. What risk are you taking? Their investments failing and them not being able to pay me back. Right. So you're taking investment risk. But wait a minute. If you take investment risk with Circle, but you don't get any investment income, is that a good deal for you? No. Okay. Um, you're taking any other risk besides the investment risk with Circle? Well, I'm risking... Okay, so that would be uh, execution risk, right? Uh, suppose Circle went out of business. Yeah, so you're, <laughs> you're taking the operating risk gone, right? of Circle. Well, it may or may not be gone. They could go out of business. You may have a claim with whoever Circle gave their money to. Um, so that might work. But you do see there's operating risk there as well, and equity risk. But wait a minute. Let's suppose you gave Circle $100 million, they get $100 million USDC, okay? Circle invests it, they invest 75% of it in T-bills, 25% of it in bank accounts. Circle uses six banks that they've disclosed. Three of those banks went bust last weekend. That's why the, uh, the USDC depegged, because Circle didn't have access to, these US, these, to, to the dollars over the weekend, number one, and the banks that they put it in, 50% of the banks that they used had issues, either taking the receivership, 
you know, collapse, etc. That's a big problem. And again, how much compensation are you getting for all this risk? Zero. Now, if Circle is investing, if Circle is investing the money that you gave them in loans, treasury bills, commercial paper, etc., that means that the collateral that you gave them backing, let me see the USDC again, sir. The loans that you gave them back in this USDC, this is really a very token, much more valuable than the USDC, but we'll get to that later, right? The loans that you gave them back this USDC, um, or the collateral that you gave them, are encumbered in the loans that they made. So they made loans to somebody. The US government for treasury bills, commercial paper could be some other company, even themselves. If you read the BlackRock Reserve Fund, um, which is Circle's basically uh, investment fund, to generate yield off of the money that you gave them. So you gave them a million dollars, a hundred million dollars. They invested by buying, by making loans to other people. You get this token, which you can actually give back to them and get your hundred million dollars back. Now, if I took this token and I lent it to Messiah for him to uh, do business and lend it to somebody else, how many loans did I make with the original hundred million dollars? Circle did one right, with the treasuries and the commercial paper, the $100 million, and they gave me this as a receipt. I took this receipt and I gave it to Messiah. He makes another set of $100 million loans. That's $200 million of loans over how much collateral? The first $100 million? Or? Yeah. yeah. So I turn $100 million into $200 million. Doesn't that sound magical? Now, the magic ends when someone wants their $100 million back, right? If, suppose everybody asks for their money back. You have to get $200 million out of $100 million. How do you do that? You can't. Tell that to Silicon Valley Bank. Tell that to Signature Bank. Tell that to, I can't think of the third name with an S. Silvergate? No. Okay, don't worry about it. Silvergate Bank, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. You can also tell that to Credit Suisse. And don't worry, in the next couple of weeks, there'll be more you know, bank names, and I'll forget all of them, I'm sure. But basically, that's what's wrong. It's a long-winded way of saying that's what's wrong with stable asset-backed stable coins. There's a perverse incentive. In order for Circle to make money, you can't make a dime. Right? Because they make money from lending the money that you give them, and they have to count on you for not expecting any return for all the risk you could take. Investment risk, operating risk, execution risk, regulatory risk, everybody's coming down. And even if you just cancel all that risk out magically, which you can't, but let's assume you can, you still don't have a dollar. You have a receipt for IOU. So if you went and tried to invest that dollar, particularly in any debt or anything that encumbers it, you rehypothecate it. Hypothecation is when you encumber something with a loan or a pledge. So you did that once when you gave stuff to Circle, right? When you gave your money to Circle. So you gave your collateral to Circle, they went and spent it, you give it to somebody else. If they spend it again, you hypothecate it twice. So we hypothecate it. So that's once we circle, $100 million a circle. They're making loans. I get this USDC. Here, son. I give it to my son. And then he goes and he invests it, right? And he loans it to somebody else. And then they take the loan that he took, that he gave them, and they go and they invest in the market and lend it. That's three levels of hypothecation. Then the fourth person does it, and they go do it. They've printed money now. You've created money out of thin air, very thin air. That $100 million became $400 million of liabilities. All cool, and everybody's making money. They're making 4 or 5%. Sometimes you're advertising 7%. Hex, which is an absolute scam, the biggest Ponzi scheme I've seen, I think, is advertising 39% APR, 39%. Four times you spent this money over, 39% of pop, everybody's doing well. Crypto rich to the moon, Lamborghinis, until someone wants their money back. So how are you gonna do $500 million of lending at 39% APR or for just $100 million? So that first $100 million, there's a loss, someone asks for the money back, and then you have, I don't have all the coins on me, you have the domino effect, daisy chain. Because everybody who borrowed money now wants to get, uh, needs to pay it back. So it's a big, now is it a perverse incentive, but it reverberates risk in the market. 
Now, let me get that back to all the regulators and the naysayers and anti-crypto guys. Oh, it's a big Ponzi scheme, blah, 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 blah. What I explained was the U.S. banking system. That's all. Fractional reserve banking. I just explained it. And it's not the U.S. banking system. Ask those guys over there in Switzerland with Credit Suisse. Okay? I guarantee you, I'm not going to guarantee, but I'll bet your next paycheck that it's going to happen again very time, sometime soon. Tether, and I am not pro-Tether at all, right? Tether went through the Terra Luna collapse. I think they redeemed well over $20 billion worth of uh, U, um, Tether USD, USDT redemptions. And if I'm not mistaken, they didn't skip a beat. They're still in business. They're doing well. As a matter of fact, they're at the top of the game, and their lead increased by a lot when uh, USDC broke its peg. And the Binance coin was basically you know, attacked by the regulators, et cetera, et cetera. So what happened to uh, Signature Bank and Silicon Valley Bank and what's the other bank again? Silvergate. Silvergate. They couldn't do it. Right? They collapsed because people were asking for their money back. So contrary to popular belief, here you have a stable coin provider that is much stronger and much safer than the regulated multiple times over at state and federal level, FDIC insured, heavily capitalized banks with liquidity minimums. They need to be more Tether-like. Is Tether better? No, but they're fully capitalized one-to-one, -one, or at least allegedly. Suppose Tether's lying a lot, and they only have 50% of the money to back it up. They're still much better off than the banks are. Much better off. I said it. That's right, I said it. Come after me. Tell everybody to come and argue. Get this on Twitter. Let's get the discussion going. Do the math. The math is right. Next question. Question. Do you, do you think the fractional reserve system has allowed for more economic growth than a fully reserved system would have? Um, say it loud enough to make sure that it comes on the camera or come in a little closer. Do you think the fractional reserve system has allowed for more economic growth over the years than a fully reserved economic system would? I won't repeat the question because I don't know if it'll catch it. Okay. Go ahead. You repeat it. You repeat it. Oh, I was asked if the fractional reserve system allowed for more economic growth than a fully reserved system, using those words. And the answer is, yes, of course. You know, it does. But you've got to think about the question. Let me rephrase that question differently for the layperson. Do you feel that robbing banks allows you to get a higher income than working at McDonald's? Yes. Until what? Till you get caught. Then it doesn't look all that advantageous, and actually you find working at McDonald's is much more profitable because you get a couple of hundred thousand dollars up front robbing banks, and then you live the next 20 years of your life in prison. So the fractional reserve system makes, um, puts significant amounts of elasticity into the economy. Okay? You can stretch, you can grow, you can lend a lot more, but you're lending what you don't have. That works very well until something happens and people need their money back. Then it comes tumbling all the way down. Look at the, let, let's put a realistic um, turn on this. Uh, today, Bloomberg reported that the bondholders of Credit Suisse First Boston um, have an effective valuation of exactly what the return is you get on USDC. Remind me what that was again. Zero. Say it again. Zero. Okay, so the bond value, $17 billion of bond value of USDC is worth zero. Okay? Does it really matter what return those bonds were offering if it all drops to zero? Now, if you had a fully reserved bank, and I know someone actually who was offering, who tried, who created a bank and was trying to get uh, access to the Fed's discount window for a fully reserved bank crypto bank. It's called Custodia. And it um, was founded by ex Morgan Stanley employee, Caitlin Long, Caitlin Long, and a uh, very, 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 very smart person. She has my full respect. They dissed her. She wasn't part of the club like I'm not part of the club. I think she's much more part of the club than I am, but we're obviously both not part of the club. And they just refused to give it a license, you know. They went past their statutory limit to respond by, I think, a year. 
19 months, and they just ended up not giving it to her. And which is interesting because they, and the reason was because of risk. They said it was too risky. So they said that a fully reserved bank is too risky, but the factory reserve banks were not too risky. And the factory reserve banks went bust one after another, five of them in a two week period. She, I think she's right, I think they're wrong. Okay, so as for whether a factory reserve system allows for more growth, it allows for faster growth. At the end of the day, risk adjusted, not more growth. You know, if you wanna make money, make money on fees. Don't make money on gambling on the lack of uh, exigent, exigent circumstance, because that's bound to come back and bite you. Did I answer your question, son? Okay, do you agree with the answer? Speak up like loud. I think if, if you don't want to be in the camera, just come closer here. Or if you want to be in the camera, you could join. But I just remember you're like W2, so we're going to limit your liability. <laughs> Can you see him? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to protect you, so get out of the camera. Because, you know, demand. <laughs> We're going to fix that W-2 problem momentarily, but okay. So a debate between my son and I is actually uh, very, very interesting. Okay. Oh, you know what? That video is going to get you in trouble too. Okay. A, a, a debate between any of my three children and I are interesting because they know everything and I know nothing. So, <laughs> right, son? So go ahead. Tell me what you're going to say. I partially agree. Mm -hmm. um, an ill managed fractional, fractional reserve system, like you said, would lead to faster growth, but long term, maybe not more. I think a properly managed fractional reserve system would lead to more growth in the long term and the short term. Mm hmm. Give me an example of what a properly managed factory reserve system would look like. I mean, I'm not a finance expert, but... Well, just so you know, you're much better at finance than the vast majority of people, including the people in finance positions. And I'll say that, and that's not nepotism, it's a fact. So give me, a, give me what you have to say. I just think, or I know the fact, or the thinking in general, the idea is to allow for um, capital that's not being used to be lent out to people that need capital. Mm -hmm. The fully reserved banking system wouldn't be able to do that for the most part. Okay. But I think a fully reserved system is using capital. It's not that it's not being used. It's that the people who are in favor of a fraction reserve system don't like the way the capital is being used. In a full reserve system, the capital is being used to what? Reserve the system. That's why they call it reserve. That capital is being used. It's being used as a reserve. So the fraction reserve um, proponents are saying uh, it's not being used. That's like a good example, perfect example, perfect example, car insurance. When you buy car insurance, you pay a premium for one year, okay? You can drive around and saying, well, my insurance is not being used because I didn't have an accident, so I'm gonna cancel it. But your insurance, is being, your insurance is being used to cover you for the risk, a risk that is over time inevitable. But because you didn't have an accident, you're justifying and canceling insurance because you're saying it's not being used. It is being used, it's being used to reserve against the risk. Okay, you're not really reserving against the risk, you're selling the risk off to an entity and the entity is accepting risk for a profit or a presumed profit, depending on whether you need to um, have an accident or not. So what you're purporting is because we're, you can be more efficient by taking that premium that you're paying the insurance company and using it to do something else, like pay, buy a pair of Yeezys pre Kanye collapse or, you know, a new flat screen TV or, hey, circle private stock or Coinbase stock. We'd get to that soon too. Not buying that. <laughs> <laughs>
But I counter that with saying a reserve is called reserve for a reason, and a reserve is used to reserve against risk or future need. You disagree? Okay. Speak up loud so it can shine. I say I guess it's just a matter of fact of which is being used more effectively or I guess which efficiently is the word you're trying to use, right? Efficiently, which uh -huh. use is creating the most economic growth for everybody. Okay. And that's understandable. But raw or notional economic growth is very different from real economic growth. Okay, so you know the fractional bankers would say, fractional reserve system guys would say Look at the amount of growth we've achieved, right, by freeing up this capital that was in reserve against risk to go and build new buildings next to empty buildings, next to buildings with a for sale lot, next to buildings that are in foreclosure. Okay, but the reason why they're able to do that is because it's not really their money, so they can take profit at risk. Now, if you take all that growth, that nominal growth, and then you discount it, or you adjusted for the risk, or not for the risk, for the losses that you took when you build all these empty buildings, six more empty buildings, and you take all that loss and you discount the growth, you will probably almost guaranteedly have a lower number than if you just took your time and started growing. You want growth, I would want the economic growth of the country to come from actual economic growth from businesses, not from financial engineering and playing games with money. You know, I'd much rather make more Microsofts and more Googles and more Intels and more, I'm not really feeling Apple, <laughs> more Samsungs, Apples, etc. because that's actual growth. Or you could have more Credit Suisse or Goldman Sachs where they take money and they put it behind their back and they take four coins out the other side. Not knocking you bankers and traders, but that doesn't lead to true economic growth. Those are playing games, okay? Exactly how much value does the banking industry and financial engineering lend to the community, to the society, or to the world? There is some, I'm not gonna say it, but not nearly as much as most bankers say they do. You know, there was a CEO of a very powerful bank, I'm not gonna name Goldman Sachs' name, but he said, Goldman Sachs is doing God's work. Please. <laughs> And I'm not anti-Goldman Sachs, but come on. Go ahead. So, um, what would you say in a scenario where, you know, a multinational scenario, where you have one country who's, or let's say originally everybody has decided to go with a fully reserved banking system, and then one country decides to go fractional reserve, kind of kickstart their economy. Mm -hmm. Would you say the rest of the country should let that country go ahead and watch them boost their economy while they all stay behind in the safe but slow growth? I don't believe it would be slow growth. It would be slow growth in the financial engineering sector. But if you take your money and you use it to invest in actual industrial growth, I think you can surpass it in real terms, right? Having banks send coins back and forth, like the three call Monte game, you ever see that? Right? Doing that back and forth, you don't create more money that way. And banks take money and they shovel it back and forth, and they say, look, we have more money, we have growth. China is not renowned for that. You know, from what I understand, China's GDP um, is boosted in many ways that most other people wouldn't think it would. When China builds a building, that construct the construction of that building goes to GDP. That building can be built, remain empty for years start to deteriorate, and then China takes that building down. The deconstruction of that building adds to GDP. So they have twice the GDP number when a more realistic way of looking at it would be GDP would be negative twice. A, you created jobs, you built something, it wasn't used, that excess economic, that economic capacity um, went unused, and then when you take it down, you made no more money from that as well. So you have one set of numbers that go for additional jobs, and then you have two sets of numbers that go negative. Unused capacity, and then taking that unused capacity down. China is showing, so if it was $100 million to put it up, and $100 million to put it down, China 
is showing $200 million worth of uh, GDP gain. In reality, you have $100 million of GDP gain and roughly $150 million of loss. So it should be a negative $50 million in reality compared to China's positive $200 million. Over time, those numbers add up and the fake numbers are up here, the real numbers are down there. I want to be the country that puts the building up, that building is populated over capacity, and then other people come up, want that building, and they pay for another building to be right, um, built. Country over here, country A, but also country B by a large margin, irregardless of, or regardless of what the numbers of country B says. So there's reality. Don't let, and we live in New York, and the largest industry in New York is finance. And we have a lot of base industries, core industries, but I think Wall Street is number one. But we have fashion and marketing and advertising and all types of stuff. I think a lot of people are enamored by high payouts in the Wall Street industry, but they're ignoring the fact that they're just taking one dollar, putting it, and every time it shifts hand, right? Every time it shifts hands, the bank industry takes a little piece off. They get rich, they buy nice cars, they lobby, pay politicians. But the reality of the situation is they're not adding real economic value. The only way to add real economic value is to make the economy larger and not take money and go back and forth hand in hand. I like doing that. You agree with me or disagree with me? I disagree. Disagree? Well, go ahead, push back then. I, mean, I, think, I, mean, I think bankers definitely have some value. By, like I said before, they allow for capital that was typically not being used or being used to a minimal extent. Used by people who are trying to make business. Well, speak up now, speak up. You know, capital that wasn't being used to be used by business people, people mm -hmm. that are trying to do something productive. Mm -hmm. And now we'll stop right there because I didn't say it wasn't being used, I said it was being used as a reserve against risk. Yeah, right. Learning capital that typically was being used just to. Saving essentially, mm -hmm. and we're letting that being lent out to people who like to do something that may be productive for the economy. Okay, so here that segues into something interesting. Um, I purported to have invented D5. One of the um, outgrowths of that invention is what is something that's now called on demand liquidity. And on-demand liquidity shows how to really put dormant capital to use in a more efficient way without the risk of just taking money, going back and forth until something blows up. When you have a bank, okay, and you have, uh, I don't want to blow you up, but you put your name in there since I'm becoming like public enemy number one, amongst the bad guys at least. So we have uh, Daryl, that's your new name for the purposes of this recording. I already gave him my son's real name, so it's unfortunate. Don't walk next to him in public, right? So Daryl has Daryl Bank, USA, and he does a lot of remittances. And then there's uh, Dyson Bank in the UK. No, um, a smaller country such as uh, um, Albania, okay? So Daryl Bank, USA, does business with Dyson bank in Albania. Okay, Daryl sends lots of, uh, Daryl's customers sends a lot of remittances to Albania. Okay, and Albania every now and then sends currencies back to the U.S. I don't know what currency Albania uses. Do you know? The what? Lek. Lek. Yes, I knew that. <laughs> so, um, so normally when you send U.S. dollars to Albania for Lex and Lex to the US for dollars, you have to have a reserve of that currency to pay out. So you have to have a whole bunch of LECs. I'm assuming the LEC is much weaker than the dollar. And you have to have a whole bunch of US dollars. Those are called Nostra accounts, you know, where basically it's just to prove money sitting there dormant, presumably be getting minimal, getting minimal interest. Okay, so when you send $100,000 over to Albania to exchange for LECs, Right, the money gets to Albania, and then they give lex to the uh, to the holders of uh, 
to the people who be sent the U.S. dollars to, assuming they want um, Lexus to the U.S. dollars. When you do that, you have $100,000 of cash there. So you need the Lex to give the people, and then when you give the Lex out, you have $100,000 of U.S. The other way around, if they want to send value to the U.S. and the U.S. wants to give out Lex, they have to have a bunch of Lex sitting in the account. Having this money sit in these various accounts is inefficient, as the king of finance to my right just said. Now, you can sit there and gamble with derivatives and fancy trading and everything else, and you could get a return on that money, and now you're putting that money into productive use, but you're also taking risk as well, right? And before I fin finish this train of thought, just go back to my insurance example, where paying insurance is, is inefficient because I haven't had an accident for two years, so I'm gonna stop paying my insurance and I'm gonna put it in something else instead. But when you have that accident and it totals a car and you know, the car lender comes for their money and you can't pay it, you now remember that money was being used. It was being used to finance the car insurance. So to get these no-show accounts to be more efficient, you could go and gamble them away and do it very well until you don't. Or you could use my invention, which is now called on-demand liquidity. With on-demand liquidity, you take a currency. In the patent application, it actually used BTC as the bridge currency, which acts as a bridge. There are other companies such as, uh, I'm not gonna name the company, but they use a different bridge currency called XRP. And you can use anything else. You can use yen or whatever you want. This bridge currency allows you to free up all the LEC you have in the Nostra account and all the US dollars, or much of it, not all of it. So now, instead of sending US dollars over to uh, Albania, right, to be paid out in LEC, you can send US dollars to an account, and that account takes the US dollars and it buys a uh, very token. Okay, let's use assume the very token is a bridge currency. Then you turn around and instantaneously take that very token and you buy LEC. And then that LEC is now um, sent to Albanians who want it. So you've created uh, a bridge and you circumvented the need to have $100,000 in account and $100,000 worth of LEC in another account. And you just did the connection directly by using a bridge currency. And the bridge helps convert it. This can even be fairly volatile because when you do the transaction, it's in real time. So you're not catching too much of this volatility. Or it could be a stable currency that's not that volatile, but it shouldn't matter that much. That was one of the um, descriptions in the patent specification. Um, and it's written dynamically using New Zealand dollars, US dollars, and BTC as an example versus very tokens like in US dollars. That is a way where you use actual and actual invention to create um, a more vibrant economy and put capital to use without taking undue risk. Your risk is limited to the volatility of the bridge currency. And the longer you take to execute that bridge trade, the more risk you have. Do it instantaneously within a few seconds, close to no risk at all. Even using something super volatile like Bitcoin. Okay, so that's an example. Again, so maybe people should listen to more HBCUs. Graduates. I'm just doing that because nobody ever, you know, pumps up HBCUs or Howard or Spelman, etc. So we'll do it today. Okay. I'm a Howard grad, by the way. Um, you disagree or agree? Speak up so they can hear. Pick it up in this mic. Mm -hmm. or lesser used capital. That idea was discovered by me in 2013-ish. Well, actually, I had that idea way before that, but it was reduced to practice in 2013-ish or 2014. The patent is in 2014. You know, the first patent was in April 2014. So it's new, but it's not that new. It's almost 10 years old. I think what banks do, though, is they take the biggest source of money or minimally used capital, which is people's savings, and put that to use. Okay, but why can't you use on-demand liquidity for that? From, no, for, from what you explained, I think that's mainly used for like, um, currency conversions. 
well, yeah, well, used for cross, uh, cross country payments or cross currency payments, I'm sorry. What the banks do is they send like a set of mortgages, is, or what they attempt to do mm -hmm. is find safe investments for people's savings. Bank and safe ex investments in the same sentence. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> in the same sentence. But let's see here. The issue with that, issue with banks making safe investments is the same issue I have with Circle. There's a perverse incentive. Okay, the incentive for banks to make safe investments are not really there. The incentive for banks to make high risk, high return investments is very, very strong. So, Daryl. You work for a bank, okay? Or you have a choice of two banks, or two jobs within the same bank. We go call this bank Silverman Bank, you know, Silverman Sachs, okay? So you get two job offers. One, you get offered $180,000 a year salary, $20,000 bonus, and you're gonna funnel a bunch of bank deposits from one place to another at the same rate, which is low, low volatility, that's the offer. You could get that, you could start next week. The other one is going to give you a base salary of $675,000 with the possibility of two times bonus. So you could bring home roughly three point something million dollars. Okay? But you're going to take fractionalized CDS and you could sell them off on a leverage basis. Which would you pick? For what reason would you do the unsafe investment option? My pockets. There you go. <laughs> and that's the banking system's compensation in a nutshell. Most people will pick number two unless they don't have access to number two. That's why most people work in the bank industry. Not because they want to make the world a better place through finance. It's because they want to make as much money as possible and the banking industry overpays its employees. It's just that simple. Anybody who thinks I'm wrong, come see me at Richie Middleton on Twitter. Start the conversation. I dare you. I'm picking fights now. Okay. <laughs>